This is study number five, entitled Jesus the Teacher. I like that. The best symbol that could be picked for uh, a picture like this, which deals with the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ, is the lamp. The lamp of learning. So that is a sort of a universal symbol of the teaching ministry. Now, of all the titles that Jesus has been given, and of all the activities that he performed, I mean, he was a preacher to the multitudes at different times, he was a healer, he counseled people, he did a lot of things. But of all that activity, the best known appellation for Christ is rabbi or rabboni, which means teacher. So if you are involved, and all of us are involved in teaching in one way or another, if not formally in a given program, then informally you still are a teacher in the broader sense of that word, in your family setting, when you uh, dialogue with your neighbor, or in the variety of opportunities that God opens up to you where you communicate with people and many times get into some discussions that are not superficial or surface in terms of their, their purpose, but get down to some of the major issues of life. You're a teacher. And so never feel that that is something that is insignificant. You stand in a, a good, good heritage. Our master, our savior, was best known as teacher. Now, I talked about the fact that people sometimes begin to talk about major issues. And when you look at that lamp of learning, that lamp of learning is the artist's way of reminding us that through the Gospels, as you go through the teachings of Jesus Christ, you find out that he speaks to the major issues. This is not trivia material. Some people get a lot of fun out of uh, uh, trivia games, and they like to get a hold of a lot of incidental information. Uh, and I suppose that's okay. I've never been too hep on it. Uh, I read a person one time that said, this is a philosopher, don't burden your mind with incidental trivia. Get a hold of the major concepts of life. And uh, that stuck with me. And, but at any rate, Jesus was that kind of a teacher. When he spoke, people listened because he spoke with authority and he dealt with major issues. Now what are the major issues? And I've listed them on your worksheet, so here they are. The bottom line issues of life, as we put it in our own language, are number one, who am I? Well, what did Jesus say with regard to that? I think of all the different times that Jesus spent time with the have-nots of his society. The people that the religious establishment had written off and felt were not worth the time of day. Jesus gave time to them and it sort of rattled the cage of the establishment. They didn't feel that he ought to spend time with people who didn't count, at least in their way of thinking of values. So what does that tell you? That tells you and me that Jesus looked at every individual as having significant worth. He didn't use the word, everyone is created in God's image. But that's essentially what this means. Everyone is significant in God's eyes. I don't care what color is skin. I don't care how much education. I don't care how they dress. I don't care how lettered or unlettered they may be. Everyone is important to God. And that's what you find in the 
practice of Jesus Christ. He, he talked about the animals of the field. He talked about the birds of the air. And he said, you know, your heavenly Father takes care of them. Are you not worth much more than they? The hairs of your head are numbered. See, these are statements that come from Jesus Christ. Who am I? In the eyes of Jesus Christ, and in the eyes, therefore, of God himself, I am a person of great significance and worth in his eyes. That's very, very significant. You know, there is that little syllogism we use sometimes, I am not who I think I am, I am not who you think I am, but I am who I think you think I am. Well, you can add to that. There's truth in that syllogism, but they add something to it. I am who God thinks I am. That's, that's important. And so people were lifted up because they had a sense of who they were after they had been around Jesus Christ. So that deals with a basic question of life. The second, what is the purpose of my life? You know, Jesus said of himself, to this end am I born and for this purpose came I into the world. He knew who he was and he knew what his purpose in life was. And I'd like to believe that uh, the Lord says in effect, you put your life under my lordship. I've got a plan and a purpose. And under my lordship, your life is going to have meaning and purpose and direction and significance. It's utterly unthinkable. You find nothing at all in uh, the writings of Jesus Christ that this life really doesn't count. It's kind of a holding pattern. You've got to get with him and believe in him so that you have your life, you know, assured in heaven. But, but what you do with your life is inconsequential. That is totally foreign to the teaching of Jesus Christ. This life is important. He has, you know, the, let me start the sentence by saying this. The Westminster Shorter Catechism has a statement in it, in a question and answer, that has lived uh, through the ages and will continue to be a classic statement. And you probably already know what I'm referring to. What is the purpose of man? That's the question. The answer, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The purpose of our life is to bring glory to God in the ways in which that can be done in our own unique life and opportunities. That's what he says is our chief purpose. Third question, what is God like? Well, it's a very important question. And Jesus, you know, we've gone over this in the earlier studies. He said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All these statements indicate that Jesus tells us exactly what God is like. How can I be on good terms with him? Well, Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And uh, he indicates repent and uh, um, believe and you shall have eternal life. So Jesus clearly indicates that we come into good terms with the Father through the Savior that he sent. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All of those statements indicate that Jesus is the reconciler. He is the one who makes us acceptable to the Father. And finally, what happens to me when I die? And you could give a lot of wonderful statements to that. Jesus addressed that major issue again and again. But in John 14, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. 
that answers that question so directly and clearly. So when you come down to it, Jesus answered all the major questions that confront humankind. And when he spoke, people listened because he spoke as one who had authority. And when you come to that little statement that I gave to you in the little narrative about Karl Barth asking, being asked the question, what's the most basic thing after all of your reading and all of your study and all of your writing, what does it boil down to? Jesus loves me, this I know. How do you know that? The Bible tells me so. And so we take Jesus' word as being the North Star and the bottom line and the answer. That's where my faith is. So when I look at these major issues, I listen to what Jesus said. And I wrap my arms of faith around that. Around him who is the way, the truth, and the life. I'll tell you. You know, it's wonderful, uh, you know, to have your finances in good order and have a sense of security about financial things. It, it's nice to have uh, uh, relationships with friends on the bright side so you feel good about that. All of that's great, but there's nothing more important than to know you've got the answer to these questions because Jesus gave the answers to you. Jesus, the teacher, addressing the major issues. Now, let's go to the picture one more time, and, uh, well, we're going to do it 12 times this study. <laughs> so let's look at the curtains here. On either side, curtains. And, and, and it, so it kind of reminds you of a stage. All right. And we like to push the curtains back and see what's behind them. This tells us that humankind is incurably or insatiably curious about the future. We want to know about the unknown future. Uh, that's why horoscopes are so popular and, and uh, all the other kinds of things that uh, are practiced today in such a large way. They're advertised on TV. You, you have people who serve as sort of psychics, you know, being on TV and, and, and they get a question and they give an answer and it's a little commercial. And then they give you a phone number. So we are really people who like to know everything we can about the unknown future. So, is this okay for Christians to do? Why or why not? Now, I'll give you a couple of passages of scripture, and uh, you can write those in the, uh, in the margin there. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 15. And all of us have read that probably, and it wouldn't hurt for us to read it again, so I'll turn to it. When you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering, and do not let your people practice fortune-telling or sorcery, or allow them to interpret omens, or engage in witchcraft, or cast spells, or function as mediums, or psychics, or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is an object of horror and disgust to the Lord. And then verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites and you must listen to that prophet. That prophet is Jesus Christ. So another verse that I want to give you is in a passage that I dare say you haven't, haven't read recently. The Epistle of John, and it's a one-chapter epistle, and it's the ninth verse. And here you've got a statement that uh, really speaks very, very clearly as well. If 
you wander beyond the teaching of Christ. And that's what this is doing. When you want to know more than what God has revealed in his book. When you want to know more than what the Bible tells you, then you're wandering beyond the teachings that God has given. Let me read it again. If you wander beyond the teaching of Christ, you will not have fellowship with God, writes John. But if you continue in the teaching of Christ, you will have fellowship with both the Father and the Son. So why uh, do we not mess with these kinds of things, the mediums, getting messages from the beyond, uh, horoscopes, tarot cards, Ouija boards, you name it. Why don't we mess with these things? Because God has said not to. That's why. I don't go, be I draw a line in the sand, I don't go beyond fortune cookies, that's, that's it. <laughs> that's right. I don't want to read a horoscope. I don't want to mess with any of that. And people who have been in counseling as counselors can number up case after case after case of people who have come in and when you finally get to the root of their, their particular problem, uh, many of those people point to some experience that they have had with the occult. It puts a band around you now some of these things I think are done simply because the psychic may be a very perceptive and very intuitive and wise person who can detect something from people's body language, from their history that they give or from what they have said. And so they're just giving some pretty smart answers on the natural level. Some of it is scam, but some of it, friends, is supernatural. So that actual things do happen in terms of a miraculous supernatural way. But it is not God at work. It is Satan at work. So that's the bottom line for me. And the bottom line is God knows what he's doing when he says don't mess with it. Everything we need to know to live well and to die well, God has revealed for us. And he said, I want you to walk by faith, take my hand and walk with me, period. That's it. So that's what the curtains remind us of. Jesus told us all that we need to know to live well and to die well. Now let's go to the picture again. And you'll notice that the big crown at the top of the picture here refers to God's, a crown should remind you of one word, sovereignty. It tells you that God is sovereign. And uh, so let's take a look at uh, what that means. And uh, I'd like to have you uh, get to your Bethel material and uh, reread a section on the bottom of page 31 and the top of page 32. This is what Harley Swiggum has to say about this concept of that big crown, God's sovereignty. Jesus did a lot of teaching about the fact that God is sovereign. God claims sovereignty over two kingdoms, heaven and earth. And many times we say, well, I'll let him be king of heaven, but I want to handle my own things on earth. No, no, no. He is king in both realms. Okay. Mortals are meant to live under his rule in both domains. The prayer taught us by our Lord affirms that very thing. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He is sovereign on earth as well as in heaven. We are not to procrastinate, therefore, and put off obedience to him until some veiled moment in the far future. We are called to serve him now in this historical moment and in this vineyard. And then he gives several references there. It is his ground on which we live, his good gifts that we use, his air that we breathe, his sunlight that we enjoy. This is the Father's world. 
And while we pass through one of his domains on the way to another, we are called to bear the standards of the king every step of the way. We are even now under the marching orders of the commander of heaven's legions and are but a step away from a kingdom which has no end. That, 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 that's a, a, a wonderful statement. But we tend to walk around as though we're the owners and we're in charge. We are stewards. Under his lordship we have responsibility, but he is always the owner and he is the sovereign. And we are people under his orders and under his direction. So uh, I ask a question here. We say that Christ is Savior and Lord. Now what do those two things mean? What does it mean when we say Christ is my Savior? Yes, what does it mean? He opens the door for us. We, we believe in him and we follow through to... What is he a Savior from? Saved us from sin. All right, from sin. So we have an understanding about what it means to, to say Christ is my Savior. He's the only one who can forgive sins. And I need that. And he's the only Savior. Okay, now take the second one. When we make a confession of faith, we say he's Savior and Lord. Now what does Lord mean? Our Master. Our Master. He's, he's the one who has a right to call the shots. He's the one who is... And, and, and now, which of those two is the easiest for us to accept? Savior. Which one? Savior. Savior. <laughs> right. Can you take those two and say, I'll buy the one but get lost with the other? No. You know, in the scripture, they belong together. When I was in seminary, uh, it was my assignment one time to write a, a, a paper on these two concepts and whether or not they, they belonged together in scripture. And I went through, you know, a lot of reading in the Bible and in other sources. And the answer is, God never intended those to be separated. They belong together. To take him as Savior is to say, in effect, in gratitude, Lord, I will say what Saul said on the Damascus Road. Lord, what do you want me to do? That was Saul's response <laughs> to his Damascus Road experience. Okay. Now, we're going to take a break at this point and uh, move into the rest of the picture following a little discussion. We now go into segment number two, and we start with concept number four in the picture. Concept number four deals with the first diamond in the crown. And uh, that reminds us that Jesus Christ proclaims to us the, uh, the purpose and the will of God. The purpose and the will of God. That's the first diamond. Uh, so I ask myself and I ask you the question, what is the, the, the central theme in terms of what God is about? What, what is the thing that is at the very heart of God's activity here on planet Earth? What is the central purpose and will of God? That's really what we're asking. And I think we may have sort of an amorphous idea of what God's about. What's his main business? When Jesus was in the temple at age 12 and his parents found him, you know, after a, a couple of days, uh, then he said this, do you not know that I must be about my father's business? And they were perplexed, as, as they might well be perplexed. And we ask ourselves the question, what is that main business of God? Well, if you take a look at the early narrative in the book of Genesis, and you start out with Genesis 1 and 2, and you see the paradise that God created. And then you go to chapter 3, and you see how humankind despoiled 
that creation through sin. And they're ushered out of the paradise. And in chapter 12 of Genesis, you've got God saying to Abraham and to Sarah, here's what I'm going to do about this sad state of affairs. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. And by you, all families of the earth will be blessed. Now, there you have God's game plan, as we've said in the Old Testament studies. And you know that when you come to the New Testament, Paul in Galatians 3.8 calls that verse in Genesis 12 the gospel. So that gives you an idea that God's main business is to redeem and reclaim what humankind has despoiled by sin and disobedience. That's what God's business, main business is. I have a verse that uh, is found in John 640, for this is the will of my Father that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. So it deals with reclaiming people's lives but it's broader than that, too. God cares about all the affairs of light, not just people. He's in the business of reclaiming the disordering of human life that happens here because of sin on planet Earth. Listen to the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, again. Thy will be done on Earth as it is in heaven. That's Jesus' prayer. That prayer tells us that God's main business is to reclaim and reorder life so that what was once his intention and his great plan can be ultimately restored. And we're in the business of doing that reclamation job under his love and lordship and with his power. And when he returns a second time, he's going to finish the job. So that's, as I see it, the will and purpose of God. And he wants us to be on board with that. To be his child is to be a part of the team. I grew up on a farm, and I soon learned that to be a boy on the farm with a father who's a farmer meant I needed to be a part of the family venture. And my sisters likewise for the things that the women did. And my dad got a little bucket and he had a five gallon bucket and I had the one gallon bucket. He had the big pitchfork and he gave me a little pitchfork. I wish I had saved that pitchfork. It would be a wonderful treasure trove. Years I spent working with that little pitchfork because I was a part of the team. I knew what the father's business was and mother's business was. And to be a child meant I was a part of it. Now that happens, of course, best on a farm. <laughs> I understand that. You can't do that so well if your business takes you hither and yon as the vast majority of people have. But uh, that, that has led me to, 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 to believe so deeply. I'm a, I'm a child of the king, and the king's business is thus. And I've got a little pitchfork, and I've got a little bucket. He's gifted me, he's gifted you, and we're a part of that wonderful purpose. So when you see that diamond in the crown, just remember that's your diamond too, <laughs> and my diamond. Now let's take a look at that second diamond. That's item number five. The second diamond in the crown has to do with the fact that uh, Jesus reveals the true nature uh, of, of, of God. What is God like? Well, that's a very important question because, you know, ultimately, he's the one with whom we have to do. Uh, for those of you who are, are members of this congregation or uh, listen to the Hour of Power, you hear the benediction repeatedly. Uh, in that day in which there is no sense in enduring, but it is preceded by this phrase, when we stand before Jesus. You see? Ultimately, he's the one with whom we have to do. 
we give an accounting to him. That's found in, 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 in many of the parables. And then to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I mean, that's the best statement that could ever reach our ears. So, he tells us something about the nature of God. Now, uh, we have discussed the fact that if you were to approach anybody on the street, you would probably get a, a variety of different answers as to what God is like. And uh, one of the, the dominant ones is the, the resident policeman. And if you ever get in a bookstore and see uh, that little book by J.B. Phillips, Your God is Too Small, it's worth picking up and reading that whole section where he talks about the destructive images of God that are found about in society. So they think God's business up in the heavens is to watch to see if he can find anybody doing something wrong. And he's got a billy club. That's his job. Well, take a look at John 3, 16. You know that verse real well, but look at John 17, 3, 17. God sent not his son into the world to <coughs> condemn the world. Out goes the resident policeman image. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God's on our side. God's for us. He has our best interest at heart. So those are the kinds of things that we need to keep in mind when we dialogue with people. We, we, we deal with distorted concepts in terms of what God is like. And people can hardly believe it, that God loves them. They believe that they've got to shape up and live a perfect life before God will pay attention to them or they could possibly have an audience with him. Wrong! God says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We can't shape up by our own self to begin with, and it wouldn't be a good enough shape to meet God's demands, secondly. And so we come to Christ, and, and He forgives. And then God looks at us through the eyes of Jesus Christ, so to speak. He becomes our righteousness, as we'll study later on in the New Testament studies. So that is the second diamond. Jesus really seeks to help us to know what God is like and to have an image of him that is in tune with the scriptures and is so much needed in our world today. We go now into segment number three and we deal with the, the sixth item on your worksheet, which deals with the, the item in the picture here. We, we, we finished with the first and second diamond, the nature of God and, and the will and the purpose of God. A and now we're dealing with Jesus giving us a good picture in terms of what human beings are. What is the true nature of human creation? And that's what the small, um, crown is about there at the end of the staff. He reveals the true nature and purpose of man. And as you can well expect, there's a real clash between what you hear Jesus say about the purpose of human life as we live it and the purpose that you in either covert terms or overt terms here announced on the media and among your friends at the business or the neighborhood shop or wherever your path takes you. There's a real clash between how the world sees the nature and purpose of human life and how God sees the nature and purpose of human life. You got to know that that meets head on. So what is the common concept of the goal and the purpose and the meaning of human life that you pick up from society? Well, I have uh, put it down in terms of four words. And you probably have seen this before, but these are four words that all start with P. It helps me to remember them. Number one. 
possessions. All right? It depends on how much of a bankroll. I mean, a person that was in a class that I taught a number of years ago said, my aim in life, my goal is to be a millionaire. And he accomplished it. And he wrecked his family, and he's deceased now, but he accomplished it. <laughs> and it almost reminds you of the parable that Jesus gave of the rich fool. And uh, so, what is it uh, worth to, to gain the world and to lose your soul? All right, a second one has to do with position. And very closely connected to that would be power. Some people uh, have a great craving for, for power that often attends uh, a particular kind of position. And so to have, uh, <laughs> I suppose this is not too important, but let's just say uh, your, your placard on the door and uh, a place to park your car with your name on it, or you know, all the accoutrements that go along with a position, but mainly it, it gets bound to the fact that I feel now in the corporate structure or you name it, I am a somebody. And people say, my goal in life is to be at the top of that heap. That's not strange. You hear this all the time, right? I do. So let me give you another one. Pleasure. And of course, uh, you know, if you just get the right kind of toys together and the right kind of vacations and have the, all, the, all the kinds of stuff that uh, they're trying to sell, you know, those people really aren't out to give you pleasure. They're out to get money. I mean, let's make no bones about it. And they sell it because we're pleasure hungry people. And so we want all the toys that the Joneses have too. And that'll give us a sense that uh, we've arrived. And uh, <clears throat> now I've decided that I'm going to uh, make one out of, out of power here instead of adding it to this one here. And there are people who just have a great deal of, um, of uh, hunger to have control. All right, now are these things wrong? No, the Bible says they're not wrong. Money, for example, take a look at the first one. It is the love of money when it becomes a God, when it begins to take the place of God in our life. The chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's a well-crafted statement that's solidly based on Scripture. So goals and drives are great as long as they're subsumed under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So you take a look at the verses that I gave you here in Matthew 6, 32, 33. Uh, Jesus said, uh, you know, I take care of the animals of the field and the birds of the air. Aren't you worth a lot more than they are? And so uh, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you as well. First things first, seek first the kingdom of God. That really says that over this has got to be the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And if that is where our heart is, and if that is where, what drives us, if this is the passion of our life, His Lordship and to be what He wants us to be, and to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, you may have a lot of possessions that come secondarily. And you may have a position where you get to be a household name among a number of people or even across the world. And, and, and I'll tell you, pleasure probably isn't the best word, but you'll have joy. And maybe you will have uh, control over different kinds of things. But all of it is under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and that's really what charges our burners. 
if these things are the things that drive us, then the Lord is saying, as you look at these verses, are you really seeking first the kingdom of God? Are you really seeking the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life? Jesus in Mark 8, 34 and 35, which is the second verse that I've given to you, uh, says, he who would seek to find his life is going to lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake and the Gospels is going to find it. Same thing, different words. We have to lose ourselves in something bigger than ourselves, namely Christ and the Gospel. We lose ourselves in him and then we find ourselves. I picked up a book the other day when I went to hear John R. W. Stott speak and I had a chance to ask him a question about what a good resource might be for a particular project that I was working on. And he said, you know, uh, my book on authentic Christianity would be uh, the best thing that I have uh, in my writings for your project. So I got the book and as I was plowing through it yesterday, I came across a statement that fits right here. See how it fits. He's talking about one of the religions of our time called New Age religion. This is, and he is no slouch when it comes to scholarship and understanding of, of what's happening. So I trust his words. His words are, the New Age movement expresses a preoccupation and even infatuation with self. More than that, I do not hesitate to say, it's Fundamental egocentricity is blasphemous. It puts the self in the place of God and even declares that we are gods. New Agers have surrendered to the primeval temptation to be like God as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God in this way of thinking is effectively dethroned. It dispenses with God, the Father, the transcendental creator by identifying him with the universe. That's sort of a pantheistic uh, strain in it. But it is essential for us to distinguish the creation from its creator and to affirm our creaturely dependence upon God. Well, those are good words. And it just goes to show you that there's a tremendous lot that is going on in our world today by way of thoughts and philosophies and value judgments that really clash with what Jesus is announcing here. And the only way I know for us to keep our heads on straight with regard to these values and, and the way we order our life and the way we think is to keep listening to what God is saying. So a lot of times you're going to read parts in the Gospels and as we get to the letters a little bit later on, things that you've underlined and, and you've read many times before. But we need to be reaffirmed. We need constantly to hear God's voice because we hear the clamor of all those voices all the time. We need to stay tuned in to our good Lord because he's got our best interest at heart and he knows what the score is and he is the one that we ultimately have to do. And I think that's one of the reasons why you and I, as we read through this, find our hearts warmed and we feel uh, uh, refreshed and lifted up. And there's something inside of us that says, this is right. This is true. And we can identify with that statement that when Jesus spoke, people listened. It says, and he spoke as one who had authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees. That kind of authority brings through the reading of the gospel. What a wonderful opportunity we've got. I, I, I'm, I think I'm the, you know, hey, man, I can do this. <laughs> I've got time to do this. And we got time to get together to share. And you've got time to write papers about it. Don't pinch yourself. That, that's not a laborious task. That's a wonderful privilege. And it pays great dividends. So let's go to item number seven. The beams from the crown bathe the kneeling figure in the light. All right. Now, here we come to the concept that from God's crown, we have light that shines down to earth where we live. 
And what Jesus now is talking about is that if you want to appropriate the good things of God, the abundant life, you've got to be God-related. You've got to be in communion and on good terms with God. And I raise the question, what does it mean to be God-related? And I make a point that in the Bible, you do find different patterns as to how people get God-related, as to how people come to Christ, as we would phrase it today. And I give you three examples in your worksheet. Here is the example of a Saul on the road to Damascus had a very dramatic encounter with the living Christ. And that changed his life in 180 degrees from persecuting the church and being an enemy of Christ, he become a missionary, planting churches and sharing the good news of Christ. A dramatic conversion. He could say it was on this day and it was on this spot that it happened. Very dateable. But then you come along to a Timothy. A Timothy was, you know, a soul buddy of Paul on his first missionary journey, came to know him and love him. And he grew up with a, a godly grandmother and a, and a godly mother. And <clears throat> Paul affirmed that, and, and Paul made his profession of faith in Jesus Christ. But I don't think, uh, Timothy made his profession of faith in Christ, but I don't think Timothy was able to date it. I can't date it in my life, and maybe you can't either. That's not the key question. The key question is, are we in uh, rapport and communion and in a faith relationship to Jesus Christ? It doesn't matter how it happened, but that it has happened. I, I, I can still recall uh, some years ago when the Do God is Dead movement was uh, very popular <clears throat> and Billy Graham was a guest on the Today program in the morning. <clears throat> and he was asked the question, well, how do you know that God is alive? How do you know that these theologians that talk about God being dead aren't correct? And Billy Graham came back like that. He said, well, I talked to him yet this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you see? See, it's that walking relationship of a, with a living relationship with a living Christ. And uh, that that be in place is the key issue, not how did it get in place. So I don't think Timothy could name the day and the hour. I can't, as I indicated, uh, but I do know that I, I, I can resonate with what Billy Graham had to say. And uh, that relationship is very, very real and is the taproot of life for me and for you as well. Well, then let's take one other Bible character, and that's a Thomas. Now, Thomas seems to be a person who went back and forth. Uh, he, he doubted a whole lot. And when it came time to uh, recognizing Christ as being risen, he said, unless I can put my finger in the nail prints and into his side, I will not believe. And uh, Jesus made it possible for him to do that. And he said, my Lord, my God, a statement of faith. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, you know, but blessed are those who having not seen and yet believe. And in 1 Peter, in that first chapter, there's that beautiful statement in verse 8. Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. That's it. See? Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. So some come by way of a lot of debate and back and forth and doubts and and there and it's it's a struggle. And, and, and some come by the way of a Timothy pattern, and some come by way of a, a dramatic, dateable experience like Saul. But Jesus says to everyone, he who comes to me I will in no wise cast out. I love that verse. <laughs> it's tremendous. See? He who comes to me I will in no wise cast out. And the part that we need to underline in our Bibles, and we'll do this when we come to Romans, but in chapter 10, Chapter 10 gives us a clear indication 
that if anybody says to you, how do I accept Christ? You can turn to that passage and you can say, we need to confess him with our lips. And I quote the 13th verse says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God promises that if you pray to him and ask him to forgive your sins and to come over your life and to take charge, that God says, you called upon me and I am now answering you. You are one of my children. I'm going to walk with you. But it needs to be verbalized. It needs to be a prayer from the heart. And so that's how God relatedness happens as the Bible presents it to us. Now we've got another item here that uh, is very descriptively done by the artist in this picture way down on the bottom section we've got two masks, a white one and a black one. And as you can well guess, those masks deal with the kind of values that masquerade for life, but they are false values. And so Christ calls us to throw aside the values that are put on the top of the, pot, uh, of the totem pole by uh, the world. And Jesus, in effect, says, no, that's not where it's at. And I want to tell you, those are false values. They mask for being where it's at. But sooner or later, you and I know it leads to emptiness. And they do not deliver. They do not deliver. Testimony after testimony will verify that what Jesus said is true. And so we've already talked about uh, several of those masks that tell us where it's at. And Jesus uh, indicates it's not so. And I give you Mark 10, 35 to 45. And I, I like that reference because it tells you that believers, just as well as other people who aren't connected to the Lord, believers struggle with this. In this passage that I give reference to, in Mark 10, you have James and John sidling up to Jesus Christ. And what is their request? One on the right hand and one on the left hand. Position, position, position. <laughs> That's what they're vying for because they are still thinking it's going to be an earthly political kingdom and they want to have the second and the third best positions. <coughs> and you know, within the band of disciples, even to the closing days of Jesus' ministry, they were jockeying for position. I don't know if that's comforting or not. <laughs> It, 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 I guess, uh, tells us that we struggle, they struggled, but Jesus is there to help us, help us to put first things first and to deal with the foibles. God's got a lot of patience. He must have a lot of patience with us. The way we mess around with these values of the world that really masquerade for being true but do not deliver. And we need to hear Jesus saying to us again and again, but this is where it's at. This is where it's at. It's hard, but it's true. All right, let's leave that uh, set of masks, discarded masks, and go on <clears throat> to the storm clouds. And you'll notice that there's lightning streaks pictured in this picture and and the, the sky is dark and so that's the clouds look really black and so that's a portrayal of the fact that uh, Jesus is saying as I've already intimated it's not going to be a piece of cake it's not going to be a piece of cake because there's so much roundabout in the world that it's gonna uh, it's gonna be tough for you to understand where the values are and to steer a course according to the North Star. And so he talks about adversaries. 
Now, in Bible scholars' terminology, there is a trilogy of adversaries, and maybe you've come across it in your reading, but they are as follows. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those three. And you find them all in Scripture. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, what I've done... Well, let me explain a couple of those. We all know what the devil is. But, but, but what is the flesh? The flesh in the New Testament is a portrayal of our old human nature. That nature that all of us have inherited, which is a proneness to sin. We all have it. And I'd like to think that when we accept Jesus Christ and receive a new nature, that the old one would go exit left. But it doesn't. The Bible teaches that side by side there is the old nature and the new nature. And we've talked about this somewhat, so I'll just leave it at that at this point. But that's what some translations will call the flesh. And that's where you get the phrase in Corinthians about being a carnal Christian, a fleshly Christian. People who are immature, who are shallow in their commitment. Okay, we let it with God in terms of where they ultimately are. That's God's business. But there is some kind of a inadequacy. Paul says to the Corinthians, you're carnal. You're carnal Christians. You're immature Christians. You, you, you've got fights all over the place. And, and you're desecrating the Lord's Supper. And, and you're choosing of sides. And all of those kinds of things that ought not so to be in the church. Well, at any rate, what I've done at this point is to have you take the phrases that I give in your worksheet on a parable of the soils. Matthew chapter 13 where you have Jesus' explanation to the disciples of the parable that he taught them, okay? So, here are the phrases, and you identify with which of those three adversaries Jesus is alluding to in this parable. The first one is very apparent. It, it talks about the evil one. Yeah. And, all right, there you got the devil. And the evil one wants to take the seed of the word and Take it away before it ever has a chance to take hold in the life of the believer. And that's Satan's delight. And that's exactly what he wants to have happen in every one of our lives. Not good, but Jesus said that's who he is and that's what he does. Second, he talks about the shallow soil. The roots don't go very deep. All right. What is that? The flesh, okay? This is the shallow commitment kind of thing. This is the carnal person. Delight for a little while, but as soon as the going gets tough, it's, it's, they don't hang in there too well. The shallowness of commitment. And then finally, the message is crowded out by the cares of this life, or as some translations say, the cares of the world and the lure of wealth. And what do you have there? The world. And we're in that world. And we are bombarded with the messages of that world all the time, seven days a week. And we need to know how to sort all that out. And that's what Jesus is saying. Because all of us want to have a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold. See, this is a great parable of promise. But Jesus is saying, just remember those storm clouds. Just remember the adversaries are there. You're living in that kind of a world. But I can help you. Be strong in the power of his might. As Paul would put it in Ephesians 6. Okay, now we come to the towel and basin. You know, I'm waiting to hear about someone who said, I have seen the towel and the basin in a stained glass window in a church. And I don't know <laughs> if you've ever seen one, but it belongs there, it belongs there. What does this deal with? It deals with responsibility. And so uh, salvation is free, but by way of gratitude. Now listen to me at this point. 
Salvation is free, but by way of gratitude, we take on responsibilities of what God wants for our life. And that's what this one is about. So with that, we're going to break and uh, we'll discuss this for a few moments. We move now to the last segment of uh, study number five. And uh, we want to just touch briefly on this matter of the, the basin and the towel. Uh, that's a beautiful symbol that uh, ought to be really emulated, I think, in our, uh, in our churches because it reminds us that we are servants. And of course, it reminds us of Jesus in that upper room taking the towel and the basin and washing his disciples' feet. And he said, what I have given you an example, what you have, I have done to you, I want you to carry out uh, to the people of the world that, that uh, God loves, and he loves them all. So we are servants. He who would be greatest among you must be servant of all. That's the mark of greatness in the eyes of Christ. That obviously speaks of responsibility. We're his servant. And just as the cross, which was a symbol of absolute shame at the time of Christ, has now, because of what Christ did on the cross, has become an emblem that we wear on our clothing and put on the steeples of churches. He has transformed that into something of glory. By the same token, Christ has taken the symbol of the servant, which even today, I think, certainly in the time of Christ, was a very demeaning and dehumanizing kind of occupation and concept. And Christ took that concept and he transformed it into something glorious. So at the highest term that we can hear at the end of life's way is, good and faithful servant. And so we, we, we can be proud in the best sense of that word of being a servant of the king. There, there can be no higher calling. And obviously that refers to responsibilities. And that means because the king is who he is and we love him and rejoice in all that he has given for us and are grateful to him, we find great joy and fulfillment in, in serving. Jesus said, you take my yoke upon you and you will find rest for your souls. That wonderful passage in Matthew chapter 11. So that's what that towel and basin is about. And now we move to item number 11 and look at that briefly, that flower bed that you see here at the foot of Jesus Christ. And what I want you to do is to simply look up those four passages of scripture that are given there and say to yourself, wow, all of those are inherited when I say yes to Jesus. They're mine. I need to appropriate them, thank him for them and utilize them. They're mine. And then finally, we come to item number 12. And that uh, has to do with the key and the diamond on the wrist of Jesus, the teacher. The key and the diamond. And it's as though Jesus is saying, beyond these wonderful treasures that you inherit, they're yours because you said yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now there's much, much more that you can receive if you hunger and thirst because these are things that I give only to people who are hungry. Uh, years ago, especially when we were going through some difficult times because of a serious uh, illness, uh, uh, the, our youngest daughter in our family, who now thankfully is well and strong, I talked to her yet this afternoon, but at any rate, that was tough going time, as many of you have experienced in your own pilgrimages. And Catherine Marshall uh, came to be a kind of a spiritual mentor 
for me and Anita as well and we read a number of her books and uh, I won't go into some of the special things that God brought into our life that helped us so much through her writings but let me just mention the title of one of her books it's a title something more and one thing I appreciate about Catherine Marshall is that she had that strong sense that we as God's people many times suffer from eyesight we just don't see and have a hold on all that God really wants to pour into our life. But he says, the rich I turn away empty and I fill the hungry with good things. Are we hungry? Do we desire the things that God desires for us? So what I have done in your worksheet is to give you a, a prayer that came to my mind. These words are sort of familiar to you and I'm going to read it and then as we close we're going to pray it together. But I'll read it for you first. Lord, help me to see myself and the world that is around me through your eyes. And most of all, help me to see you as you truly are. I want to change my distorted views for your vision. And Lord, help me to take action which is appropriate to this new vision. You have said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Give me, O oh Lord, that kind of hunger. I entrust my quest in faith to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And with the reading of that, we're going to pray the prayer now together, giving our hearts and thoughts to it. We close our study of Jesus the Teacher. 